Welcome to the Gabriel Carrera Show, where we dive deep into the world of entrepreneurship and speak with those who are truly crushing it in business. Our first series, the Modern Desert Builder Series, takes us to the city surrounding Joshua Tree National Park, where we'll be interviewing some of the most innovative and successful home builders in the region. From stunning designs with amazing views, these builders are beautifying the desert with homes that are as unique as the landscape that surrounds them. Tune in to the Gabriel Curtis Show and hear the stories of these modern desert builders and many more inspiring entrepreneurs and discover the lessons and insights they've gained on their journey to success. Thanks for having me, Gabriel. <laughs> First off, thank you, Derek, for um, you know, being willing to hop on this podcast today. I know we've talked about it a few times and um, I'm super excited to have you here. Um, we've known each other for like a year and a half or two years or so and um, you know, I'm excited to see your projects come to life and always inspired by your work, bro. Thanks, man. Thanks for getting me stuck out here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, well, first off, I want to kind of take it from the start. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how your upbringing was, what, you know, what that was like, um, what you were surrounded by and, you know, obviously finish it off with um, stuff more local and, you know, things you're doing today. Got it. So yeah, I started off in real estate when I was about 18. It was a family business. Um, so I got my license actually right when I turned 18 years old. And I didn't go to college as I was like, I'm going to crush in real estate. And wow. then um, like two years later, year and a half later, the market crashed and we had the huge housing collapse. And, um, you know, I was like, shit, what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so I started doing short sales and I started advertising nationwide and doing a lot of short sales and loan modifications um, throughout the nation for tons and tons of homes. And it was kind of a new thing at the time. So it was constantly changing and evolving. And um, eventually, once I saw the market make a turn where I thought it hit the bottom, I went and bought my first deal in 2010. And I actually borrowed money from my brother at the time. And um, that was it. I kind of just steamrolled it and been doing it ever since. Nice, nice. So you um, realized that you kind of got like, um, I'm, I'm sure you were like shocked when the whole market took a hit and stuff. How was that transition like? It, it was it was crazy. As my dad at the time was investing and um, pretty much, you know, everything went down. He lost all the homes. Wow. And um, so I saw it firsthand of like what happened. And um, you know, I was just like, what do I do with all of these leads? I don't want to buy another house because I just don't want to lose money on the deal. So I was like, what can I do? And that's how I transitioned into short sales and loan mods. Not really many people were doing it at the time. Okay. And um, just kind of dove in there and learned it as, as we were doing it. And uh, we were one of the top producers at the time. Wow. And um, it was a lot of work, though. A lot of customers, a lot of banks weren't sure how to handle it. So as soon as I saw an opportunity to start flipping again, I was like, you know, I went all in and um, just borrowed money and bought my first deal. Nice. So how many years were you doing short sales before you bought your first deal? I think it was around like two years, probably. Okay. And uh, we grew it real fast. Um, we had like four in-house underwriters for the low mods and short sales. Oh, nice. and it, it was just a weird time. Not many people knew what was happening or how to do it. And, um, you know, it worked and it, it was lucrative. But, um, you know, my passion was always to remodel homes and fix and flip. So as soon as I saw that opportunity, that's when... I was like, all right, let's get out of this mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was definitely a mess in that time, you know, especially in that market. I know we had a recent adjustment here, and that was, you know, gave a lot of people a lot of panic. A lot of people panicked and, you know, dipped and ran for the hills. But, you know, I know back then it was way crazier than it is now, right? Yeah, I mean, it was a completely different market. Um, it was driven by, you know, bad loans. No yeah. one was qualified. Everyone had teaser rates, and it was just like the perfect storm. Wow. So when you bought this first property, where was this property located? It was actually in Duarte, California. Okay. It was a little two and a one. Is that like a farm town or? No, no, it's a city. Um, and, you know, I just, it, it was a little two and a one and I borrowed the down from my brother and found a private money lender to put up the rest. And um, it was a nice little flip. You know, back then the numbers were a lot smaller than they are today. Yeah. Because we were just coming out of that recession. So, um, you know, it's a lot different game now. Yeah, so from that first one, you just got the momentum and you're like, okay, I'm just going to continue doing this over and over and over again? Yeah, basically I took the profits from that one and just kept reinvesting it. So I did one, then I did another one, then I did two, and then, you know, two again, and then four, and then just slowly built it up. 
Okay, okay. And then, like, um, just ramping it up, you kind of realized it worked for you, so you're like, hey, I really like this. Were you already designing the properties yourself and everything like that? You're very hands-on. Were you working in the, in the projects? What was your, um, like, what were you doing in the project specifically? Just organizing it, kind of getting everybody on board, or were you actually there, like, with your crew, or how was that like? Yeah, I mean, I never did the work um, hands-on, you know, grabbed a hammer or anything like okay. that, but I've always... Um, pretty much tackled everything um, as far as design, the acquisition, the marketing, you know, raising the money. Um, and also, I'm an agent, so I'd always list my own properties as well. Okay. Um, so I've always been hands-on in pretty much all aspects of it. You know, it probably, looking hindsight, hurt me not delegating, you know, and creating more time for myself, but it's very hard for me to outsource when I just find it easier just to do it, which, you know, can go either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've talked about this yeah, a few times just because, yeah. um, you know, when, when we, uh, I think the first time we went out for, for lunch or dinner, um, you were talking about, hey, yeah, I wake up like at five and I just start running my ads and I start calling all these sellers and I'm like, man, you've got all these flips and you're still like very hands-on with all the acquisition side of things, project management, you're still very hands-on. Um, what's one thing that you wish you would have delegated when you first got into flipping? Probably got like an in-house designer and um, not been so hands-on with the actual development and, you know, the permitting process and construction. Yeah. My time would have been better off um, acquiring deals. Yeah. You know, that's where the money's made. Yeah. So. For sure, for sure. And I mean, that's something you're really good at, getting good deals as well, so. Yeah, my bread and butter has always been my marketing. So yeah. I've always done PPC. I started with direct mail, but that seemed to fall apart you know, as far as return wise and uh, Google at the time was, this was a long time ago. I think it was like 10, 12 years ago. So Wow. So you're doing PPC 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I've been doing it a long time. Um, so the, you know, the cost per click was substantially lower. Yeah. And um, it, it was crazy. I mean, it was just such a great time. They, the costs have gone up substantially since then. It still works, but n not the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you went from PPC and then you explored like direct mail. You also explored like texting for a while, right? Or yeah, yeah, I did uh, launch control for a while, which nice. was, it was crazy, especially, especially out here in the desert. You yeah. Know, like fishing with dynamite. Um, I did read fishing some things dynamite, about like it, <laughs> so I, got, I did get a little scared um, yeah. as far as getting one of these class action lawsuits. Sure. Um, but I did see a great return with it, and I think it works well. I just didn't want to get involved with that. I, you know, I felt that I'd rather not have the stress and just continue with PPC. Yeah, it was already working for yeah, you and stuff. Correct. Okay, okay. So going back to when you got went from one project to two to four, and you kind of kept um, you know growing that. Was there any specific market you were targeting, any specific niche, or were you just finding anything in SoCal? I'm assuming or. Yeah, I started L.A. County, and then um, I grew it to, you know, Ventura, Orange, um, Riverside, San Bernardino. And I even at one point in time when the, the ads started getting so expensive, I was like, you know, I'm going to try this um, nationwide, just letting it go. Yeah. And um, I did end up buying some deals out of state. And, you know, they all, they all worked out. And, um, but, you know, it's a, it's a big problem trying to run projects over there. And I think I would have been better off probably just staying local because there's enough deals in our backyard. Yeah. So, you know, it was fun. It was experience. They, they all worked out. Um, but I, you know, I recommend probably just staying closer to your pocket and just working it. There's plenty of deals there. Yeah. Some market that you're already close by to and uh, you kind of have your systems in place and stuff of that nature. Yeah. I was in this business running a crew is a lot of work. Yeah. You know, it's not like wholesaling. You know, you have to buy a property and then you have to submit for permits and then you have to run a whole team and make sure it gets to the finish line, make sure you get final. Yeah. So, you know, to do all of that just here in your backyard alone is a lot of work. And then when you start doing stuff out of state, it's, it's, it's a lot to oversight. So Also, like, different regulations with the cities and stuff of that nature. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're all pretty much similar, but it's, okay. it's just a lot of work, you know. Yeah. Um, if you're not built up for it in a huge company, it's, it's, it's a lot to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... That's what got you. And what, what states did you do these projects in? It was kind of just, I literally went all, all, all wow. open with the ads. That's so it was crazy. just whatever came to me. Um, you know, I had deals in North Carolina, Florida, Vegas, um, Arizona, New York. I did three deals in New York. Um, That's crazy. So I know you told me a crazy story about New York. You had to take your guys out there? Yeah, yeah. I'd, t I'd fly my guys out there and wow. they would do it because um, the, the help there that I was finding just wasn't... Um, 
it was just too hard to deal with them and the prices were crazy and I didn't want to have to you know, watch over their back to see the kind of work they did. So I just felt more comfortable sending my guys there. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, with all, all the other states, you also sending your guys everywhere else? or No, no, it's just New York. Okay, okay. It was a pretty big deal. So, um, but it worked out. It was nice. It was just, you know, I do like a red eye flight, go out there and then fly back same day. There we go. Um, but that was the last one. After that one, I was like, you know what, this is, this is madness. I just got to get back and, and start doing deals here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For all the, I mean, you're taking your crew out there, you're paying for hotels, all that stuff, and there's deals here, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So actually going back to one of the things you said in the beginning, so you mentioned, you know, you grew up, you know, your dad was like in real estate, he was already investing and stuff like that. Do you think that allowed you to see this as a, you know, possibility for you where you could just kind of like, you know, go and grow fast and not have to like go to college and stuff like that? I think so. I, you know, I saw what, since I was, you know, around that business, I saw the opportunities that were there. Yeah. And um, schooling always came easy to me. And I did get accepted to a four-year University of San Diego, and I was just like, you know what, um, my heart's not there. And I, I kind of knew that if I went there, it would just be parting. And um, I like to stay busy. And yeah. so I was just like, you know, I'm just going to hit this thing head on. Um, so like you got the offer and you're just like, nah, I'm not going to go. Yeah. Yeah. It was more, it was more, it was more to me. I never really thought I was going to go. I just wanted to prove to myself that I could. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I got, when I got that acceptance letter, I just kind of looked at it for a few minutes and I was like, all right, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. I, I kind of wish I did. So I got to live the college moment sure. because time passes you by and you don't get that back. And it probably wouldn't have changed much. Um, you know, where I ended up, I don't think those three, four years would have changed much for me. Yeah. So looking back, I think if you have the opportunity to go, you know, enjoy that moment, you probably yeah. should. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I definitely enjoyed my time in college, even though just for a year and a half. But, you know, it's, uh, I think it's a good experience for a lot of people that they don't really like. Uh, I mean, I feel like a lot of people just think, oh, well, if I'm not going to have a, um, be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, then I don't need to go. But at the same time, like, you know, it's fun for some time, you know, and I think it's, uh, you get to meet a lot of cool people. Yeah. And I think depending on where you go, there's a lot of connections to be made as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of wish I went, I didn't, but, um, I'm not happy. I'm not mad about it. What did, how did your, uh, your, your parents react when, uh, you know, my just... parents were never like, this is something you have to do. Okay. Um, okay. so there, there was, really wasn't much reaction there. They were just like, oh, okay, cool, yeah. he's going to be a real estate agent. Yeah, they weren't one of those parents. It's like, this is it, you have to go to college. So, you know, the decision was pretty easily made. Nice, nice. That, that sounds uh, easier than my decision. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, um, okay, so, so pretty much right after high school, you went straight into the industry. Correct. Okay, yeah. okay. gotcha, gotcha. So, so you were doing, going back to what we were talking about, so you were doing some, some nationwide um, campaigns and you were doing some flips in different parts of the country. Um, how long were you doing that for? What was that? I think that was about a two year time period when I went nationwide. Okay. And, um, you know, I don't regret giving that up. I think there's a lot of deals here. And like I said, I think I missed a lot of opportunity just having my mind in so many different places. Yeah. Sometimes, um, you know, you're better off just to concentrate on one thing. And sometimes, you know, I'm a creative guy and I like to try new aspects with everything. So, you know, my mind's all over the place. Yeah. And I think it's important that you can tr focus on the, the things that make the most money. Most you know? definitely, most so. definitely. And um, before we continue, one thing you mentioned to me before was some sort of uh, other ventures you might have dabbled in. When was that? Was that before or was that after? That or? was after. Okay, so okay, I, okay. I tend to get bored and I like to learn <laughs> things that I know nothing of. Yeah. Of so um, my brother and I had created a supplement and um, it was called Buddha Brain. Okay. And um, just kind of dove right into that, not knowing a single thing about it. And I actually like to be creative. That, to me, that's the only fun aspect of real estate is seeing something start from nothing and creating this great home. Yeah. Um, also getting creative with my marketing. Like that, that, to me, is the only thing that keeps me going, really. And um, when I dived into Buddha Brain, I just saw, you know, all of this possibility. And I loved the branding of it and creating this brand. And um, yeah, so we created a supplement called Mood and Stress, Buddha Brain. And I think we still have the Buddha Instagram brain. up. <laughs> um, we, we ended up changing it into a CBD drink. 
Okay. And um, noth- knew nothing about the beverage world. So, so the Buddha brain, what like was it like an alpha brain supplement or Pretty something? Pretty much. Like, yeah, okay, my brother okay. at the time was taking some on it. Um, oh, alpha yeah, yeah, yeah. Brain, and we're like, dude. <laughs> and we saw just their ads popping up all over Facebook. And I already knew Facebook ads because of my marketing. Yeah. And I was like, this is crazy. Let's just dri- dive into this. And um, it went pretty well. I mean, we were shipping these supplements nationwide. And... Um, you know, doing great. And then we saw this CBD um, thing take the world by storm. And we're like, yeah. let's do a CBD drink. And knew nothing about the beverage world. And yeah. uh, just kind of like learned it, like got a um, flavorist and sourced all the ingredients. And then had someone in New York making the product. Wow. Shipping it to us. And um, yeah, we put every, you know, we were shipping it nationwide. We had some people on subscription and got into, I think, like 60 stores. Wow, it, 60 stores. Yeah, which, you know, Dude, to what? us was exciting. Like, we were picking yeah. this up. We were just running it out of my office that was my real estate office. Yeah. And um, it was a lot of fun, you know, like, having this team and building it. It was a complete loser, though. Yeah. Made zero money. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a great learning experience, um, but I was just funneling this thing with cash to keep it going. And, um, yeah. you know, I kind of sat back. I'm like, well, now that I learned this world, I'm like, I got to get back to what makes money. Yeah. So I just basically just pulled the plug on it overnight and just gave up and um, went right back to real estate. I was like, now that I, you know, spend all the money here, I got to make more money again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn. So. 60 stores, though. That's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. And it was more about the e-commerce. You know, we were just submitting directly from the ads, um, delivering, yeah. like I said, nationwide. Were you guys even close to breaking even or no? <sighs> You know, it's a lot of the front load costs with the beverage world. You have to buy like huge quantities to yeah. make sense and get the cost lower. Okay. So it's it's a long game. You yeah. know, it's more about getting the presence, and then I think you know getting enough um, end value retailers like to sell it to, and then yeah. you, it's all about selling it. You know, that that was the goal of mine was to sell it. I just didn't. Um, I didn't have the capital to keep it going. I had to get back to what made money. So I just, I was like, this so is So the it. whole time you're still doing your flips, right? Yeah, I still had flips going. Um, but I, I was probably 50-50 with my time uh, back and forth doing yeah. two things. Um, but yeah, that's it. Now I'm back here. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's, that's super interesting how like, you know, I feel like as an as, um, you know, entrepreneur, there's always that, like you kind of want to, you know, use your skills in another industry or something like close to what you're doing, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's so cool that you actually like gave it a try. A lot of people never really give that a try. Yeah, I like branding and marketing and, you know, the creative side, like I said, that's, that's what keeps me going. So, um, yeah, it was fun. I'm not mad about it. Okay, okay. And then when, once you um, like finished that, then you're like, never again or what? <laughs> no, I'm just waiting for the next, next opportunity. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So like one of, tell me what about the, what about one of the biggest challenges that you had on a, on a project and how you like solved that, how you overcame that. There's a lot of them. I mean, real estate, you're, that, I think flipping is basically just solving problems. I mean, yeah. every day you're hit with a new problem with some city, um, you know, ridiculous requests to get permits. Um, you know, there's lawsuits, there's fraud. So I, yeah. I, I can't really think of one. I did recently just have a fraud deal that, you know, stung a little. Yeah. And, you know, there was a lesson learned. It was something I never ran into before. And I had title insurance. And I don't know if I should dive into that or not. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that's very, like, informative for a lot of people to kind of know, you know, maybe not all the details, but at least generally speaking, like, what to look out for, you know? Yeah. So, anyways, this was a deal I bought in Yucaipa. And since I do direct marketing, a lot of times my sellers live out of state. They inherited a home. Yeah. And um, so in most cases, I actually don't actually ever meet the seller. Okay. And, you know, that's kind of why I'm able to do what I do because I make it so easy, which is why I'm the hassle free home buyer. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I deal directly with out of state sellers and it, I don't even have to see the home in most cases. So nice. this was a property in Yakaipa and the oh, seller. That was a re- smooth plug. <laughs> <laughs> so uh. the, the seller reached out to me um, directly from my marketing campaign. Okay. And, um, guy's name and it lined up with title and went back and forth you know he didn't accept the offer right away which if they do sometimes that's a red flag you know we're not paying 100 percent market value we're we're buying at a discount but we offer the ease yeah of the transaction so um you know he negotiated with me which no red flags there and we get an offer accepted 
We put it in escrow. Dang, he still had the uh, audacity to negotiate with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and actually, no, before we go into escrow, I give him a company that I always deal with who has very great reviews. Yeah, the and, title company uh, or? Uh, escrow company. Escrow company. Okay. And he responds and says, I don't like their reviews. They're not good enough. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, they have fantastic reviews. And I look at the the reviews and there's like two bad reviews yeah and he points those out i'm like oh my god right so i'm like um well i could find another title company escrow company and generally a fraud deal is they would want to use their escrow company so i'm waiting for him to say that but he's like no you pick a better escrow company yeah so i go and find an escrow company that's literally zero bad reviews yeah. and i'm like dang this guy really wants like a legit company yeah no red flags again so i open up escrow um, escrow officer sees no issues and um, we close escrow guy gets his money and I start working on the home yeah and then um, sure enough the neighbor comes knocking on the door like three days in I've already completely demoed the inside and roof and windows and um, she's like I just got off the phone with the owner he never sold the home and I'm like wait what what are you talking about she's like yeah the owner I'm like that's who I dealt with yeah. Shoot, I think we got to scratch that name out. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to blurp that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll throw um, those in there. Yeah. So, anyways, um, it was the same guy I dealt with, and I'm like, this, this is so odd. I'm like, are you sure? They're like, yeah. So, anyways, I, I call escrow. I call title. Yeah. And I call the notary who notarized the deed, and I'm like, did you notarize this deed? And, and um, once I get him on the, got him on the phone, he's like. I don't have that signature in my book. Wow. And I'm like, can I send you a copy of the deed with the notary stamp? He's like, yes, please do. So I send it over to him. He's like, that's my stamp, but it's not my signature. Wow. So then I call, I realize, oh, you know, shit, this is fraud. So then. So, so hold on though. Um, so escrow usually calls to schedule the notary to go to the property. Did escrow call or did he pretty much call escrow and say, hey, I'll just use my notary? So, yeah, I mean, the escrow company I usually deal with mm -hmm. a lot of times, and, you know, it's not 100% of the time because yeah. sometimes there's certain circumstances, but a lot of times today they will require one of their notaries to go out. Yeah. In this case, because there was no red flags and the escrow company didn't feel the need, they didn't request that. So he had provided the notarized deed. Okay. And it had a real stamp on it that, you know, and it, it all checked out. Um, but they never called the notary personally, which a lot of times people don't and title companies don't. Yeah. So anyways, I, I, you know, I'm like, this is fraud and sure enough it was. And, um, you know, luckily I had a loan on the property and they had, you know, I had a lender policy nice as well as an owner's policy. But lesson learned is since we acquire these homes at a discount, a lot of times your loan is higher than your acquisition for rehab. Yeah. And the lender policy covered the lender, but since that policy was more than my owner's policy, because an owner's policy only covers the amount you purchase the home for, yeah. they basically exhausted all of the coverage for me. So I actually now have no policy anymore. That's and um, so you really got to protect- so the lender took all the money pretty much that the title company was going to give out. Correct. So now if they're, and I don't know where it's going to end up, you know, the guy could be upset because I demoed a home that I thought was mine. Yeah. And um, I'm basically on the hook for that now. If it gets there, I, I'm still waiting to hear. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a so, lot of stress. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times I think today, because there's so much fraud, um, you really have to do the due diligence yourself and not rely on escrow and title. Yeah. And, you know, I'm call, calling the notary now on every transaction to verify it was actually their signature, not just their stamp. And in most cases, I am going to try to meet directly with the seller and get a copy of their ID and you know do the, the checking myself because I, I don't want to be here again. I had one literally two months after this try to do the exact same thing. They forged the stamp and uh, because this had happened, I caught him. And That's I crazy. ended up canceling the escrow and turning him into the DA and we'll see what they do with it. Wow, you think they'll do anything? Probably not. No, they, they never do. sucks, did. right? Yeah, they never do. <laughs> wow. Yeah, the guy on the um, deal I bought, um, the guy got away with the money. He's long gone. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, the DA basically called me the other day and said, there's nothing we can do. So that, that guy what, got like a, a quarter million. Yeah, pretty much. Wow. Yeah. That sucks, man. <laughs> yeah. And he's just, I guess he uh, cashed out in Mexico. 
Yeah. And um, he's, we're not, there, there's no catching him. I mean, you would think, though, like, you know, come from an outside perspective that, like, hey, you know, the DA is going to find him or the FBI is going to come and no. do some due diligence. No, <laughs> I don't think they ever do, man. They, they yeah. take forever to just even get going on the file. It's like, this guy's already long gone. Yeah. He's in Tulum celebrating. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel knowing you gave this guy a, a retirement plan? I mean, it's, uh, it doesn't actually hurt me that that much I just it's more of a learning experience and I hope that you know the seller doesn't want to press any charges you know move forward with damages because you know he did recognize that I was a victim as well and you know he ended up getting his house back we were both hurt so hopefully it just moves on you know I don't really care about the I mean obviously the guy you know, screwed me and screwed yeah. the seller, but sure. that's what happens, you know. Yeah. You're just willing to, I feel like at this point, you've seen a lot um, that you were just willing to kind of accept the punches. And yeah, you have to, you, know. you can't try to, you just have to move on. You got to keep moving on and just, that's it. There's no other way to go. Is there anything that you think can surprise you, like in this industry or something that like, you know, like, because I feel like any problem that would be thrown at you, like I feel like you'll naturally kind of just be like, okay, here's a solution, or like, yo, you just figure it out, you know? Or I mean, look, I'm always stressed out, <laughs> <laughs> like nonstop from 5 a.m. till I go to bed. I'm, you know, constantly thinking about everything. Yeah. But you just have to know some people when they stress, you know, they're stressed out and they panic, they do nothing. You just have to know there's always another way out of it. Yeah. So there's always another move, um, and you just got to keep moving forward. There's always a way to position yourself to get around it and, and keep it going. Yeah. And, um, you know, like every day you're going to run into something, you know, especially when you're doing a lot of volume, there's, there's always something new you're going to learn. There's always some new city bullshit you have to get past. Um, and and that's just part of the game. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, obviously that was, that was a really good story, you know, for people to, you know, all all the followers to, to know what's, uh, what to look out for when it comes to deals like this and potential fraud, there's definitely still happening all the time, even though we feel we're in a super secure yeah. world, all this yeah. stuff. Do you think that, um, just kind of going a little bit on a tangent, but you think with all this like crypto stuff, like title insurance, we won't have issues like this in the future? I actually do. I do think there's a market for that because I think it's so old school that, we, you know, we rely on these, um, you know, the notary stamp. To me, yeah. it just seems so old school because it's such an easy thing to copy. Um, there's so much forgery. It seems like there's got to be a better way. Um, and I definitely think the whole NFT thing could probably, you know, step in here with a form of title. Something something new. Yeah. I, I think we're due for something new. Yeah. It just seems very old school the way we do it. I mean, I think the East Coast and some of these states that don't have escrow are even more old school than we are. Yeah. Which is really crazy. I mean, sometimes you still have to sit at a table to close a transaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've done that, and it's just like, whoa, this is this is wild. But it actually, in a sense, probably stops a lot of fraud because you yeah. literally have to be there at the table with the attorney and get the deal done. So, you know, maybe it's for the better, but it, it seems very old school. When you Who do knows? It. That might be the next venture you dabble in now. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, man. Yeah. It's possible. You never a lot know. of people are talking about in the industry now how, like, oh, title insurance, you hear all the time. Well, title insurance is a scam, you know, or like there's ways you could do like fraud around yeah. it and stuff like that. So I just think, man, with this is like digitalized world we're getting into with all these NFTs and all this, you know, blockchain stuff. I think it'd be, um, you know, a way that that can actually like avoid all that. I think absolutely. I think to say that's not going to happen is is crazy. Yeah, I think it's definitely going to happen. Um, something needs to change with the system. So most definitely now, and that was like a, a very interesting challenge that, you know, involved fraud, working with a seller and stuff like that. What was, um, one of the most interesting experiences you've had, um, you know, getting some of these deals. Cause I've, I've, I've walked into some properties where, you know, you see some crazy stuff going on. You see like, for example, like cars turned around, you see the house completely destroyed people living there. Like if it's every, every, like if it's a regular ass day. Um, and there's nothing wrong with their house. I've, I've been to houses where you walk in and you see people like, you know, a lot of rats running around and people just chilling like on a bunch of stuff, a lot of hoarders. And, you know, it's, you have to hold your breath in there and stuff like that. But what was one of the most interesting or unique experiences you've had when you were like acquiring a deal and talking with a seller? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know um, you have plenty. I yeah. Have plenty. I mean, look, I've seen it all. Um, some of the homes I've seen are just 
absolutely disgusting. Yeah. I mean, no movie can make them as bad. Yeah. Um, you know, there's somewhere you can't even get within a block of the home. And like you said, you'll have someone sleeping there. Like, there's, yeah. like it's just normal life, which is so wild um, because it's literally just so disgusting. Yeah. And I mean, I've walked into houses where it's chest high of trash around the entire home. Like you're literally crawling on top of just debris. And uh, some places where they just have like a one foot, basically like one foot pathway to get around the house. Yeah. And um, it's just absolutely, um, yeah, it's crazy the stuff you see, but we've seen it all. And um, uh, I'm trying to think. I, I think I know where you're going with this one story. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, uh, no, no, no. I, I, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, the debris and stuff like that. That's, um, you know, a lot of investors see that, but I think you've seen a couple other things that we haven't. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's hard to acquire a deal, and all of us have kind of done everything to get one. So you kind of uh, bend over backwards sometimes. And um, sure. yeah, I had this one deal in LA, which I know this is where you want me to go. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a deal, and it was a great deal. It was um, over like in Koreatown, and um, great home, corner lot. And um, the seller was living there with her friend, and we basically, not we, I had to go there multiple times to close this deal. Yeah. And the uh, lady, um, she was very religious. Yeah. So I had to basically, I had to go there and sit at the table and hold hands with her and her roommate and pray for me wow. to get a wife. Like, for, for you, for for you me to, to get a wife. She wanted me to have a wife. Wow, and hey, I was it worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. Yeah, and uh, I was like 25 at the time, and I'm not a religious person. And, um, you know, I was just sitting there at this table, and I, I did whatever it took to get this deal. And I was praying, and she would send me some movies to watch, and I would, um, you know, review the movies and get back to her on it. <laughs> nice. And uh, I ended up getting the deal. It was all worth it. But um, it, was a, it was a fun experience. I, you know, it was nice to see people so religious as well, you yeah. know, not to knock on anything. I just didn't grow up that way. So it was a learning experience. <laughs> yeah, I think that's huge because a lot of times, like, you know, if you're like, you know, let's say even just in politics, extremely conservative or extremely liberal, you know, oh, this, tr this president did this or this other president is this and that. Now we're just going to try to get the deal done at the end of the day, right? Yeah, at the end of the day, you want to get the deal done. But, you know, sometimes it's interesting just to hear them out because, yeah. you know, you're like, you like to hear everyone's opinion. Yeah. And um, yeah, you'll get on the phone, you'll just hear some stuff you never heard because when you're in your world with your group, you hear kind of the same things. Yeah. And then when you're talking to someone completely different, like, yeah, ultimately you want to get the deal signed. Yeah. I mean, that's what our business revolves around. But um, it is fun to just kind of hear other people's experiences and their opinions. And yeah. some of them are very off the chart. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Especially like the deals that we look for. I mean, because these are like distressed properties, so they usually have you know, some pretty crazy stories a lot of times, right? Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, especially out here in the desert. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of crazy things. Um, so obviously, like, a lot of people kind of, I, I feel based on my conversations with a lot of sellers here that I've dealt with that have been here for a long time, you know, they wanted to move here to be more secluded, to be less away from the government and more just in their own world and stuff like that. Um, how do you feel like that's evolving now, today? Yeah, I mean, I think the demographics changed here substantially. Um, I think a lot of people originally, and it still is, I think people are moving here to be off the grid, but a lot of it's second homes. Yeah. And most of these people live in San Francisco, LA. Um, so, you know, it's going from, the, the demographic I think is probably making a complete 180 yeah. of um, who's coming out here now. Um, but no, I think, um, where am I going with this? Yeah, so definitely taking that, that 180, I definitely see that, that, that as well. I feel like you know, there's been a lot of people who have been visiting the National Park, a lot of people who like to see these viral reels and you know, TikToks on people just traveling and you know, taking a two-hour drive away from downtown LA to you know, enjoy and be one with nature. And I feel like that's kind of driven, driven demand here, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's so close to LA and it's not, you know, some of these Airbnbs are pricey. Yeah. But they're staying with multiple groups and it's, you know, you don't have to pay for a plane flight and you just get out of the hustle and bustle of LA. And a lot of people live in apartments and, you know, here they can have a home for the weekend or for the week and enjoy it. Hey, it's Gabriel Carrera here and I'm excited to share with you some new opportunities to invest in the desert city surrounding Joshua Tree National Park. 
Are you looking to invest in real estate actively, such as flips, Airbnbs, or new developments? Or maybe you partner up with us to invest passively. We have a proven track record of success in real estate investments, having made hundreds of thousands of dollars with over 35 transactions in the last two years through real estate wholesaling and investing. Our experience in deal analyzing, sales, and marketing can help take your real estate business to the next level. Plus, if you're looking for some personalized guidance, we also offer one-on-one consulting services. So if you're interested in any of these opportunities, click the link in my bio on Instagram or shoot me a DM. Let's connect and help take your real estate investments to the next level. So like, let's say like uh, three years ago, you got into this area? Yeah, so it was kind of, um, you know, once again, my marketing brings different deals sometimes all, you know, all over the place. Yeah. And, um, my first deal out here was in Landers. Yeah. And I never even heard of the city at the time. And I'm like, what is Landers? And I looked at it on the map to like do Google aerial view. And I'm like, I don't even know if I want this thing. There's nothing there. Yeah. And, um, I ended up getting it at a great deal. And this was before this was even on the map. So I, I think I picked it up for like 30,000. Yes, for a home. Deal. <laughs> it was like, uh, I think it was like 700, 600 feet. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I didn't know what I would even, I think at the time I thought I was going to get like 150 for it. Um, and I wasn't sure if there was demand here. I didn't really know much of Joshua Tree. And, you know, I remodeled it and I had like 20 offers on this thing. And I'm like, what is this area? Yeah. I like, had no idea. I'm like, why do people want this? Yeah. And, um, you know, after that first deal, then my, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, she was on TikTok or Snapchat or something, and she's like, oh, you're by Joshua Tree. And she's like, you really need to dive in there. That's a great area. And I'm like, really? I'm like, there's nothing out there. I yeah. didn't understand <laughs> it. And um, basically, you know, talked to her, and after this deal went out well above what I ever imagined, yeah. I was like, I got to open up my marketing just to Joshua Tree. And I did. You know, I did... Um, uh, PPC and I also did text blasting from uh, launch control and I just was picking up these deals and um, and then you came my way I think you had called on one you saw closed and you're like you want these lots and I, you know that's that's how it all started with this <laughs> yeah 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 that was like what a year after you started investing yeah I think so time. and um, you just came out with like four lots or something and uh ended up buying them all <laughs> yeah 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 that was interesting I remember uh, I think I'd bought a lot close like on the same street as you owned one and you had put yours for sale and then I was like uh, I think yours had just gone pending and I was like just calling to see what the number you're gonna get on it and then you were like yeah you know I bought this to develop but you know it's not what I'm looking for it was far from utilities you remember which one it was the one right off the uh, mountain there right yeah and then um, you got me connected with the buyer and he bought my lot as well and then at that point I think I had like uh, four lots that my contracts were coming soon due on and I didn't have anybody in mind to like sell them to. And I'm like, bro, you want these lots? And then you're like, yeah, you know, so we made that happen. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, you know, at the time I was like, what am I doing? But I think I'm pretty happy about it. Um, broke ground on three of them so far. Nice. And in total we have, today I think we have 12 deals going up. So 12 new construction projects in total. Nice. And uh, broke ground on three and should have the first one completed in about four months. There we go. So, no, we're excited. I, I got a little worried, but, I, you know, I think the market out here has a lot more resilience than I thought initially. I think there's more money here than I originally anticipated, and I think it's going to stay here for the long, the long haul. I think uh, yeah. more people are going to end up coming here to live here, and obviously the infrastructure has to be built out, but I think that will eventually happen. So I think it will shift from being just a short-term rental market to some people just wanting to live out here. Yeah. And I th- that's not going to happen overnight, but I think once it do- does, it's going to um, definitely cement the market and make it stronger. Most definitely. Most definitely. Yeah. Th- I think a lot of people panicked when they saw like prices kind of, you know, cool down last year with interest rates changing. And, um, you know, I feel like one thing that, 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 you know, is managing some Airbnbs out here. You have some more insight on what the market's actually doing on the day to day. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I have an Airbnb out here now, and it's it's rented pretty much every single night of the month. Yeah, I'll miss a month, I'll miss a night here, maybe two nights max, but it, it's rented every single night, and you know, that's a lower um, lower value Airbnb. It's yeah. anywhere from three ninety nine a night to a hundred a night. 
Yeah. Uh, just depending on the time, weekend, et cetera. But it's renting every single night. Nothing. I never imagined that ever. I thought maybe I'd be lucky if I got 15 nights a month. I was like, that would be crushing it. Yeah. And now it's every single night. And I'm like, you know, there's, there's demand here much more than I ever thought. Because I'm not the only Airbnb. Yeah. I mean, we're flooded with Airbnbs. And for me to be able to book every night is absolutely insane. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's just so many people that want to come here. And, you know, I always forget that it's a national park. And I think anywhere that has a national park, people will always visit. Yeah. And we're so close, you know, to LA and we're so close to Palm Springs and Palm Springs has an international airport, which, you know, a lot of people don't realize. So it's very accessible. Yeah, no, most definitely. And I feel like, um, you know, there's definitely like a lot of raw land that still needs to be developed. And, you know, the visitors, the annual visitors every year, um, I, I, I do see that, you know, continuing to increase. Just the trends are showing that there's more visitors last year than there was a the year prior. Um, how do you feel about this market in general compared to other markets? Because other markets, you know, that you've invested in in the past, you know, I'm assuming are more like residential areas, more just based off like what jobs are local and, you know, growth in the area and stuff like that, but more for people bringing their families in. How do you see um, Joshua Tree differentiating and, and the neighboring cities differentiating from, you know, these other areas that, you know, aren't vacation towns or aren't, you know, next to a national park. Yeah. I mean, I think Joshua Tree is completely different than, you know, LA city, obviously. Yeah. Um, in today's market, you know, LA city, if you have a nice product, it's still moving sometimes multiple offers, maybe even over ask. Yeah. You know, there's, there's only one LA and, yeah. um, you know, there's one orange County. So I think anything in those areas is, is completely different than anywhere else in the United States. I mean, sure. you know, obviously Miami has a huge market, but you know, there's one California, there's one Southern California, there's one LA County. And I, I don't see the market there has still been pretty strong. I think the homes that, you know, needed repair that were selling for crazy prices, we've obviously seen that softening. Yeah. Um, but going back to this market, you know, like I said, it's completely different. It is very heavily reliant on short-term rental income. Sure. So I think that, you know, since there are so many Airbnbs, a lot of people don't know how to run them. They have management companies. They're not very hands-on. A lot of times they're doctors, lawyers, and, you know, they wanted in on the Airbnb game. Yeah. So there's a lot of additional expenses there from them not being in the game themselves. And I think that, you know, they're not doing so well. I think there's a few of them that aren't doing that great. Yeah. So we may end up seeing them. Um, you know, going on the market for sale. Sure. So you may see a little flash of inventory increase there. But I think long haul, um, I think we're still very new out here and there's still obviously demand. There's still things going pending. Um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of homes being built. I mean, they've listed two ridiculous properties um, at 18 million yeah. for the mirror house and 12.5 for the one that's just renderings. Yeah, um, for the concrete one. And they've gotten crazy publicity for free. Yeah. Because it's, you know, you could go any state right now and mention Joshua Tree and everyone's like, oh, wow, that's cool. They've all heard of it. It's yeah. not something that people haven't heard of. Yeah. Like my wife lives in, you know, she's from Orlando. Okay. And everyone there knows Joshua Tree. Yeah. So it's not just this, you know, this fad, it's something that I think is going to last. People want to come visit it. Yeah. Did, did you also get the pushback from like people you knew or at least some people when you first got in here and they were like, oh, well, there's so much hype over there. Like it's kind of going to be like the next California city that kind of just dies down. Did you ever hear that or no? I mean, yeah. probably I heard it from myself. Like yeah. I'm always skeptical of everything. I second guess every move I make. Yeah. Um, you know, I always am like, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? And, you know, when I did see all these Airbnbs and something hitting the market, I did get super worried. Yeah. Um, just naturally. I'm like, this isn't, this is second homes. This is basically people are buying these for income property. And if the income drops, then why would they want them any longer? And if the rates go up, then the income drops as well. So there's just a lot of factors. Yeah. But um, I, when I look back, I think, you know, when I look as an overview, I think that we are so close to Palm Springs yeah. And I think that if you want two and a half acres and more of a scenery, which a lot of people want, and you know, True. they did it right here. I mean, most of the lots are minimum two and a half acres. So you're never going to get all of these like track homes. It's going to ruin it. It's going to stay special. Do you think that that's what's one thing that's um, making, causing this Airbnb bust? Like all these tracked homes that are like on Airbnb thinking they're going to get the same revenues as these bigger lots? 
I think that, no, I just think that it was easy for everyone at first, you know, yeah. when this first started, you can crush with just a small little rec cabin yeah. and throw some colored paint on it and do a cheap little remodel and just, you know, boom, like you had an overnight success. And now that people are coming in here and, and doing a much better job, it's more thought out, and there's much more product, I think those homes that people are getting by with, you know, Mickey Mouse remodels, are, they're, they're going to they're gonna see their income drop. Yeah. So I think the game's changed 100%. You know, you're not throwing a, a cowboy pool in the backyard and getting 590. Yeah. You know? so <laughs> it's, I mean, we're seeing substantial homes being built. And the problem is, is a lot of those substantial homes you don't actually see on the MLS because... They're doing so well with Airbnb. Yeah. They're not selling them. That's so true. You, you don't really have the comparables to justify it because no one wants to get rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I've seen that you as know, well. That, that's kind of the crazy part as a developer is you, you know, most people are developing to hold, but if you develop and try to find comps, there's not many because no one wants to get rid of them. True. True. And do you, how do you value these properties um, with the income they can generate? Like, do you base it off the income? You base it off the area? Like, what do you, what do you look at? I think area, you know, obviously now that there's more area is a huge factor. Yeah. Um, obviously the income is a huge factor, but I think you have to be careful with that because there is still more product being made. Yeah. And if that income drops, then your price is going to drop. So I think you have to look at everything. You have to look at location. You have to look at, you know, try to find some sales comparables, you know, see what the trend is of the income, if it's going up or down. Okay. And um, you just have to be cautious. But if you're cautious, I think you're going to be fine out here. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think there's many people out here that are working on small margin deals anyways. Um, you know, they're pretty, pretty nice returns out here. Yeah. So even if it does get crunched, you're still going to be okay. What do you think is something that has stopped a lot of people from dabbling in real estate here, considering the margins here are way more substantial than in other areas for, you know, your, your return on your investment? I think if you just look at like the history, I mean, the first things to go are obviously second home areas yeah. and, um, you know, desert areas. Those are always the first markets to collapse. Um, the strongest area, like I said, is, you know, being in the heart of the city, there's no more land there and you can't create any more housing. So yeah. Um, here, there's still a lot more land. Um, so, you know, just if you look throughout time, these are the areas that fold the fastest. Okay. But, you know, I, I don't, I, I've seen, obviously, we've seen price reductions. You're not, you're not running for the hills, though. No, no, I'm still going. <laughs> I, I'm building 12 homes. Yeah. Um, no, and, you know, I've listed a few of them with just renderings, and I already have some possible buyers. So people aren't giving up on Joshua Tree. There's still a lot of potential here. Yeah. And, you know, if I have another opportunity for a great build, I'll do it. You know, the, the land is still very cheap. And as long as you have the right team, you can build a product that no one could buy anywhere else for that value. Yeah. It's like some of these homes I'm building, people have looked at and they're like, how can I actually buy this for one, two? I don't believe it. Because with the cheap dirt, you can actually give someone such a nice product and such a nice home. It's such a great value. Yeah. And I think that's really important to people. Yeah. Yeah. No, most definitely. And the homes you're creating, just like this one we're in right now, you know, beautiful views all around. Um, you know, probably move the camera is just at the end, just to kind of show the view around here, maybe follow you around the property, but you know, you know, beautiful views and the, and the architecture is also very, 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 um, open, you know, high ceilings. You've got this, you know, you're going to have the nice fire pit back there, a nice pool behind us here and everything's going to be very like modernized. How did you realize, how did you, how did you choose this type of like architecture in your projects? So I've dealt with the same architect for a while now, and he's been with my team for a long time. Okay. And he's an LA architect, used to work for a huge firm, and um, it's husband, wife now, and they do this on the side. Um, but, you know, they, they love it out here because they're not restricted, and there's a lot you can do with, you know, the, you have two and a half acres in most cases. So, yeah. you know, they can get creative, and sometimes you have to tell them to settle down a little bit because they start using a lot of steel and stuff like that. Oh, and yeah. you don't want to go crazy with your costs. But um, no, it, it's fun. And I, I think I think people that, there's people that have money out here and there's yeah. people that are visiting with money. You know, the other day at Joshua Tree Saloon, someone pulled up in their Ferrari and wow. parked in the dirt parking lot. Like, wow. you know, there's, there's money here. Yeah. And if people want to get away and, you know, they're spending 20 million for a house in LA, why not have a King of the Hill home in Joshua Tree for a million five? Yeah. You know, you could take your friends there, put them up there. You could even rent it out. 
And I mean, this is nothing for a lot of people. And the house that they can get out here for a million five is unreal. I mean, it would cost six million, eight million in, in LA. Yeah. So I think that that's what I'm saying. People see value and they're like, wow, I can actually have a home that is crazy um, as far as what you're providing them. And, you know, they just can't get that. And it's a drop in the bucket for a lot of people. I mean, there's a lot of money out there still. Yeah. I most mean, definitely, there's, most there's definitely. tons of parents buying kids' houses for cash. I mean, there's just a lot of money out there. And I think if you have more, it's more important than ever than to have a nice product out here because a lot yeah. of people got away with like a rectangular box, modern. Yeah. And they were like 800 feet and they're just selling them all day long. And I think now that it's shifted, people want a higher quality home. Yeah. And I think those buyers are going to come out for it. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, they're going to be some of the most competitive ones and, um, you know, they're more unique. So a lot more interest. Um, how would you compare, let's say, because a lot of people obviously heard of Joshua Tree, right? Yeah. How would you compare Lander's market to Joshua Tree? I think, uh, you know, obviously the closer to the park you are, the better. But yeah. I think that at the end of the day, everyone just wants to get away out here and everyone wants land. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously if you have a character lot with boulders, I mean, that's huge for you. But I think that if you're Landers, Joshua Tree, Yucca, I think a lot of people will most likely be chasing the home. Yeah. Um, then the, you know, I don't think they're going to care that much because there's some areas in Joshua Tree that are flat that look just like Landers. Yeah. So I, I don't think there's much weight on that anymore as there used to be. I think people would rather have the nicer home, you know, two miles down the road in Landers than have less of a home in Joshua Tree. Yeah. So I think people will jump area more than ever. You don't think values have much of a difference? I mean, I've seen crazy comps in Landers. For example, yeah. that 600 footer for 600,000. I don't think that would happen today. Um, but I think once again, if you do a stellar product, you're gonna get the buyer for it. They're gonna see the value in the home itself and you're still gonna provide them great views and they're just gonna be 15 to 20 minutes away from the park. Yeah. Most definitely, most definitely. And all these projects you've got going on, what was it, 12 new flips here? 12 new, new construction properties at the moment. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, are you planning to like keep some of them or are you planning to see if you could just get the right offers or what, what, what would be your end goal um, ideally? Because obviously, you know, if you, you can easily keep them, refi them out, have enough equity and Airbnb them out. But, you know, I know you've been flipping for quite a while and you talk to me a lot about the velocity of just moving your money to the next deal and next deal. What are you leaning more towards right now? Yeah, I mean, in real estate, when you're flipping, you know, if I was able to hold on to every single deal uh, for when I started, I'd be retired right now and be very well off. But you, you need to free up cash to keep the deals going, to keep the business going. Yeah. So out of the 12, I'll probably try to hold on to at least three of them. Okay. This one here I'm going to keep. I'm really excited about it. That was really nice. Um, you know, but that could change. Maybe I decide to keep them all. I, you know, yeah. we'll see. At the moment, I do want to try to sell a majority of them. Yeah. Um, if I can get the number I want. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's important. That's important. Um, do you see, like, other national parks? Um, have you ever been interested in, like, oh, maybe buying something near Yosemite or Yellowstone or anything like that? I mean, that? I love Zion. Like, Zion, Zion yeah. the Narrows beautiful. Is, is beautiful, man. Yeah. If you haven't done it, you have to do it. Yeah, it's, I've been on that river walk. Yeah. yeah, man. It's like, of time. And that's another thing I never even heard of. And my girl's like, oh, everyone's doing this on TikTok. Let's go. And I'm like, oh, a hike up a river. Real cool. Like, real excited. Can't it wait was to cool, it. though, right? It was, it was probably one of the coolest things ever. Like, I would do it again and again. Yeah. So, I mean, I think to have an Airbnb out there would be great. Um, at the moment, I don't really have the time to dive in and try to find one there and put it together. Yeah. But, um, no, I mean, I'm definitely open to it. I'm, you know, I'm not, not open. Um, I do love that park, though. I think it's beautiful there. It is. It is. I remember growing up, my parents would always take us to these national parks. I've been to Zion a few times. It was definitely one of the most memorable. You see the high, like, rocks. And, yeah, and the color and, of the rocks yeah. and the, the water. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's very cool. It is. It is. Um, so, you know, you've been flipping now for how many years? So, I, I think my first flip was at 22 maybe and I'm 36 oh wow so, so you've time. done uh yeah 14 years now. yeah 14 years how many flips would you say you've done I think like 155 160 today probably okay, okay. you know I, I 
I started small. I started with borrowing money from my brother. So, yeah. you know, he was a stunt kid and he had just turned 18 and got a lot of his stunt money. Oh, right. You were telling me yeah, that. Yeah. So yeah. luckily, um, you know, I was like, Hey, and he, he believed in me. So he got me going. There you go. So if it wasn't for my brother, I don't know where I'd be. <laughs> shout out to your bro. What's yeah. his name? Cody. Cody. <laughs> shout out to Cody. Yeah. Um, so like right now, currently, how many projects do you, are you actively managing today? Right now, I think I have, I don't know, probably 10 at the moment. I slowed okay. down about like 10, 10 months ago. 10 like flips or 10? Yeah, three, well, I have three new construction deals and then I think I still have like nine, eight or nine flips probably. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could count them out, but <laughs> um, I, I stopped buying about eight months ago. I wanted to see where the market was going. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just wanted, there's so much bad news out there. And I was like, I kind of want to just dissect it and see what was happening. I also kind of wanted to see the marketing dollars to get cheaper too. I was hoping that a lot of people would back exit, out, back yeah. out, maybe, you know, not do so well on their flips and slow down and they would create opportunity there to buy again. I don't know if I've seen so much of that. I think there's still a lot of buyers out there, yeah. but I definitely feel comfortable to dive in and um, I'll probably be diving in pretty heavily again the next next month or so. Yeah, yeah. You feel like stuff has kind of stabilized out now? Yeah, I mean, I've sold pretty much everything, no issues. So I, yeah. I'm ready to, to jump back in and get some more deals. So if you got any more deals out there, send them my yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Derek, Derek is yeah. buying, Derek's buying. Um, yeah, he's been one of my, my good buyers here. <laughs> I didn't think Joshua Tree sent it to me first, but uh, we'll, 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 or whoever you like. But anyways, um, what was I going to say? So in terms of, of um, you know, you, you, you have all these flips and stuff like that. When you decided to take a break, um, do you feel like before, because I know a lot of investors that prior to this whole market shift we're just betting on appreciation. Were you ever one of those guys? I never bet on appreciation. That. So that was always a bonus. Yeah. Um, and, and that's another reason why my marketing so high is because I pass on a lot of deals that other people don't. Yeah. Um, I just don't bet on appreciation. So I make sure there's money there day one. Okay. And um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we so that. I mean, that, you know, during those COVID days, I mean, it was great. It was just like another 50, another 80 just out of nowhere. Yeah. And I never bet on that. I would bet on what the market was today and I would even just say maybe it drops from there. So I, I'm always very conservative. conservative yeah. And that's why, I'm, you know, most deals don't work for me. I pass on a lot of deals. Yeah. Um, How many deals do you like analyze a day? I mean, when I'm marketing, quite a few. Yeah. And, um, you know, in most cases, they don't work. And I get a lot of wholesalers throwing me deals. And, you know, there's a lot of buyers out there that will buy crazy deals um, yeah. and pay big money. And I, I just don't like to get into that match. I'd rather just deal with something direct with a seller and have no one else in the way. And if I don't feel good about it, they don't feel good about it, it doesn't work. Yeah. You know, and, you know, most sellers that I buy from know exactly what their house is worth. Yeah. And they just don't want to deal with, you know, the mess of cleaning it up, staging it, listing it, and, fixing this. you know, they feel good about just having someone that's going to close. And I always close. If I, if I provide an offer, I'm going to close on it. Yeah. I always have. So people know that, and I think they feel that, and, and that's what creates opportunity. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And, um, yeah, I, I, I know you're someone that, you know, for anybody out there who has any deals, shit them over to Derek. I do trust him in his ability to close and um you know we've definitely he's 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 every time he told me he's gonna close he's closed you know oh. you got on no, time. i always close on yeah. time. Yeah, yeah yeah that was that was clutch that was clutch you have to so what advice do you have for me as a beginner investor here in this area and in, in california southern california in general i think um don't spread yourself too thin like pick an area like you have yeah i would like to see you deal with some higher end homes i think that with the cost of goods and labor and everything, it's, you know, it's getting tough to make the smaller deals work. Yeah. Um, just because the remodels are as much as the, the property and you kind of have to pick them up at 30, 50 cents on the dollar to make it work. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the same amount of time to do a $2 million house as it is to do a $300,000 house. And I've told you that in the past, I, I've spent a lot of time, because my bread and butter was, you know, um, entry level properties three and a two, um, you know, end value when I first started was like half a million. And then it went up to seven fifty eight. And looking back, I wish I had done less deals, but higher end homes because it's the same amount of time. Yeah. It's, you're still remodeling a kitchen. You're still pulling permits. It's obviously 
more money needs to be raised, and that's, yeah. that's the most important aspect of this game, probably, besides a, finding a deal. For sure. Number one is buying a good deal, and number two is making sure you raise enough capital. How have you been able to successfully raise um, enough capital to do all these projects? I mean, luckily, I have a pretty good track record, so I've had good partners behind me. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I've had some bad times where I you know, grew too fast, and I've done it more than once. And, you know, that's another thing. If you're going to grow, you have to make sure that you have the capital to do it because it's hard to turn down a deal. Yeah. And I'm the kind of guy, like I said, I always close. And if I see a deal, it's, it's hard for me to turn it away. But I've been, place, I've been there multiple times where I've tried to make it to the next level, you know, with a big push and just double my inventory. Yeah. And I've gotten caught to where I had to play a juggling act with monies and basically finish one, grab that money, finish the other. Yeah. And when you look back, you know, if you have interest, you're like, shit, I would have just been better off just to do three deals instead of trying to take on all these deals. Yeah. Because you have the interest alligator. So, I mean, number most important thing is buying the right deal and paying the right price. The, yeah. the money's made on the buy. Number two is you always want to make sure you have enough capital. So yeah. being able to raise money is so important. Like that's, you know, you don't want to get into a deal and be stuck. Yeah. Because it's a lose-lose in so many different ways. One, you're too much time's going by. It could be a different market by the time you hit the market. Sure. Different price. Um, you know, you've already borrowed money, so now you're paying interest on that money and you can't complete the home. So raising capital is very important. Yeah. And um, I think I would like to see you do some higher end properties and just get into that, you know, sooner than later. Yeah. Because you'll find that they're a lot more lucrative. Okay. Yeah, just the, the bigger margins take the same amount of work, right? Yeah, exactly. Except typically the sellers can tend to be a little more sophisticated. That, that is the other side <laughs> of it. A lot of times they're a lot more sophisticated, but with those deals, there's, there's a lot more opportunity for value add as well. Yeah. So, I mean, you can create value instead of having to buy the value. A lot of times these lower end areas, you have to just buy the value because it's not lucrative to do an add-on because it's just too expensive. Yeah, yeah. I know that there's like a lot of people in this industry have like the shiny object syndrome where they'll go, hey, you know, I did a deal with a couple units. Now I want to buy like apartments and stuff like that. What has kept you like sticking to flipping single family homes? I mean, I think it's just because that's what I know. Um, I'm definitely open to it. I would say my biggest, um, my biggest flaw is, is raising capital. Yeah. Um, and I need to get better at that, and I still do. I mean, I think raising capital is so important. And yeah. um, I know how to buy deals. I know how to market. I know how to get them to the end. Hey, who knows? You might have a private lender here, man. Yeah, who knows? Maybe. Yeah. So, I mean, I, um, to me, I, I've always, like, to me to go sell myself to someone is just a weird thing. It's just not yeah. comfortable to me. Most of my investors have actually come to me because they've known what I've done. So it just kind of landed in my lap. I never really put myself out there. That's and, something we um, work on. I gotta there, work right? on yeah. it. Man. So I mean, that's that. You know, everyone has their weakness, For and sure. I would say my weakness is being that you know guy that jumps around and throws themselves around to try to raise capital. It's it's something I need to work on and. Or maybe just content nowadays, right? Yeah. Like you know, if you make a little more content, talk about what you got going on then more people would be wanting to throw themselves at you, know? Yeah, so let's do this like every day. Yeah. <laughs> we could definitely have some uh, check-ins, maybe a different podcast. We'll see. Yeah. You know, I mean, a different, uh, like a different project, you know? Yeah. Kind of walk it and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, um, that's something. Yeah, I, I appreciate the advice. And, and yeah, I, I see um, raising private capital as something very important now. I could always do better at that. And I yeah. think I probably would have tackled larger projects um, if I had done that. And that's where I want to go is I, I like the bigger projects. One, because it lets me get creative again. Yeah. Um, these entry level homes, you know, I call them the Home Depot special. And you know, it's basically the same thing, same cabinet, same tile, and it's easy. You don't have to go there, but then it just becomes a job to me. And it's yeah. more about, you know, just getting through it and you lose that sense of creativity. So when you do a nice project, you get to be there and you get a you get to get more creative again. And to me, that's fun. And also, you know, if you land the right deal, the, the margins, you know, the profit's great. Yeah. But you're dealing with bigger money. And, you know, that's, that's the rule of thumb, right? The more money you deal with, the more money you can make. So, yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. And you've got some interesting projects coming up. Um, yeah. Those renderings you've sent me, man, they're very, uh, 
you're gonna be crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah, so I have, I, I was able to land um, five character lots in Joshua Tree, and they have boulders, and... Um, Is that what you call char character lots? Yeah, like boulders, yeah, boulders, and of a mountain. great views, yeah. um, you know, they back up to the park, and, you know, seeing what's happening, and the hits, and everything that some of these high-end listings have gone, I've decided, and I decided I'm just basically gonna go all out on these. Yeah. And we're gonna call it, um, po Poesis is the collection. Oh, wow. And uh, it's five custom homes, and they're anywhere from 3,200 to 5,800 square feet. Wow. And they're gonna be like something no one's ever seen here before. So That's um, the, the biggest one of them all, we're gonna be listing with renderings pretty soon. And we will be completing that property, and it's nice. going to be it's going to be something special. What's the name of that special. one? We don't have a name for it. But <laughs> you, you've seen it. You call it the boomerang. Boomerang. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, so yeah. it, it it it's that one's going to be pretty awesome. Yeah, that one is going to be pretty yeah. awesome. And I see like a lot of these other properties that like let's say that concrete property and some of these other properties that we've seen that are like hitting the market. You know, they seem kind of like you know they don't have that much character, but the ones that you have have so much character put into them, and I feel like you can. I I feel like you'd be able to reach the prices they're asking for faster than they would. Yeah, I mean, I kind of just wanted to, you know, just go all out on these things, and yeah. I, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to be crazy and just, you know, throw myself out there. It's something I don't think is going to work. I I do think that since they're positioned at the right area, yeah, and that they're character lots, you know, not many lots have actual boulders on them. Most I think that if you do a nice product, you're going to get, there's a handful of buyers that are going to want that piece. Yeah. You know, they're going to want the, um, the, the top home there. And, of you course. know, I think they'll be fighting for it. Hey, I'm ready for that. Yeah, That's yeah. really crazy. <laughs> um, so like, what's, what's next? I know we've got these projects going on. We're going to finish these. We're going to do these uh, new builds. What's the, um, what's the five year plan for, for, for Derek Davies? You know, I think um, dive more into higher end properties. I don't want to be so spread out with, you know, 15 homes all over the place. I'd rather concentrate on five big ones. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's more, it. more ground ups, you know, these, these heavy remodels to me, they're, they're becoming more difficult than just doing ground up as I've done both. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I think that's kind of where I want to position myself. Okay. And, um, you know, that's it. I'm going to get back to buying real soon here and um, be targeting mostly just, you know, L.A., Orange County. And, um, you know, so I'm obviously going to stay out here. I'm, I'm going to be out here for the next three years building these things. But um, once I'm done with these and get some of them sold, we'll, we'll see where it takes us. You know, it's, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Yeah, and um, this first run's going to be um, real interesting, and we've had a lot of action, so I think we're going to do well on them. And if so, then you know that kind of opens the floodgates. Yeah, most definitely. Now, obviously, I know you just opened your development company recently. Yeah, Warren Development. There we go. Yeah. Shout out to Warren Development. Shout out to uh, you, Johnny. And harder, Johnny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, would you guys consider doing projects for clients out here or anything like that, or no? Right now, with Warren Development, we're just mostly concentrating on LA okay. and um, big projects. So, I don't think we would get involved out here just because it's the um, the help's limited. Yeah, and you know we have a pretty good team here, but really just to handle what we have going on since we have so much going on. So, you know, if I were to tackle something here, it. I just couldn't guarantee we'd be able to get it done in a timely manner. Yeah. So um, right now, Warren Development is strong in LA. Nice. And um, yeah, that's it. No, it's it's been fun. And um, so, what are you guys looking for? Let's uh, let people know. Just give us a call. Throw it, throw it our way, and we'll see. Okay. Any type of flip remodel. I know you guys are doing like some ADU. I think conversion. Yeah, we're doing some ADU conversions. Some um, Johnny's. Commercial. Yeah, Johnny, my partner, is mostly running those, and. Um, you know, we got some commercial things going on, so, you know, we'll see where it goes, you know, nice, just, nice. I, I can't sit still for a second, so. <laughs> so I know I've, I've sold you some pretty good lots at great prices, so when are, uh, when are, when are we going out to Tulum? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, if the weather stays like this, we'll have to go next week, I'm over this weather. <laughs> yeah, I'm down, man, this I'm is bad. down. This is bad. Do you have anything that, uh, that you'd like to tell the audience before we uh, wrap this up? Any advice, pointers to other investors in the area or any, you know, plugged shout outs? I think, um, you know, if you're just starting out in this game, I think most important, I think everyone says this, is it's just finding a good deal. Once you find a good deal, the money, it's easy to raise the money for it. 
Um, I think a lot of people get, another thing is, is, is don't think your deal is going to be better because you're going to do a better remodel. Yeah. You, you know, a lot of people think they're going to make money just because they're going to do a better job. I, I, you know, that's just upside. So if you get more because of your remodel, that's great. But don't, don't look at a comparable property and say, I'm going to get more because mine's better. I, I would use that as your comparable property. But um, yeah, I mean, it's all about finding the right buy. Um, and then the rest works out. The money's made on the purchase. There we go. There we go. And do you think, one last question, um, do you think that if you wouldn't have found this creative way to express yourself through real estate investing, that you would have found it in another venture that you would have done? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I, um, I have another project I'm actually working on. And it's, to me, I, I love advertising. I love being creative and I love marketing. So I, I think there'll be, I think if I did something else, um, I don't think real estate defines me. I really like real estate, yeah. but you know, I, I like everything that you get to get be creative on. So if you have any other ideas out there, you can throw them my way too. I'll, I'll partner with you. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Well, thanks for uh, taking the time, bro. And uh, appreciate you inspired by your work constantly. And, thanks, Gabe. Uh, can't wait to see these other projects. Yeah, me too. To life, bro. Yeah, it's exciting. Oh yeah. All thanks, right, bro. Thanks. Peace.